a little while um, about the Russian Revolution. Okay, sure. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just want to start by explaining why we chose the Russian Revolution to start off this revolution series that the MSF is hosting. And really it's because uh, April as a month actually marks 150 years since the birth of Lenin. I think it's actually the 22nd of April, which is his official birthday. Um, and the Russian Revolution is a really important revolution for Marxists to study. And there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from it, and in particular Lenin's role in leading it that hopefully we can flesh out today. So the Russian Revolution and Lenin, uh, as an extension of that, is probably one of the most attacked and slandered subjects from the point of view of the media, but also in our education system. I know the way I was taught about the Soviet Union definitely wasn't in a favorable light. And you know, this campaign to slander his name, um, Lenin's name, distort his ideas, ranges from all over the political spectrum, um, from bourgeois historians to various reformists and other political stripes. Um, and just to give an example, in a, a recent history by Professor Robert Service titled Lenin, A Political Life, The Iron Ring, it states that, and this is a direct quote from the text, although this volume is intended as a balanced multifaceted account, nobody can write detachedly about Lenin. His intolerance and repressiveness continues to appall me. And I think that that really just sums up uh, the outlook of the bourgeois. The ruling class really have a hatred for Lenin uh, and his ideas and the whole of the Russian Revolution. And they'll do everything and anything they can to discredit it, uh, which begs the question why, of course. And I think to put it really simply, it's, it's because of what happened. Uh, it's very hard to pretend that the revolution didn't happen in that, you know, this was the first time the masses, millions of ordinary people, moved to overthrow the tyranny of the old Tsarist regime. And this is a regime that had lasted for hundreds of years um, in order to take power into their, their own hands and begin this great historical task of the socialist reconstruction of society. And no one can take away that colossal achievement as much as the ruling class attempts to bury it in media and in our history books. You know, our role now, what we're trying to do is, is, is expose the truth and kind of claim that legacy and the honor of the Russian revolution. And so I think we should start by thinking about what sort of place Russia was at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, there was a real monstrous regime, I, I would say, under the Tsar. Um, in terms of the conditions that people were living in, but also the, the amount of repression that existed. Trade unions weren't allowed, obviously strikes weren't allowed. The church also had a very firm grip over education as an example. And it's into this oppression really that Lenin is born. So the objective picture in Tsarist Russia was quite a dark one. And I would say that that's also true and was reflected in the political arena. In the late 19th century, the early 20th century, the forces of Russian Marxism uh, were still extremely small. And there was a lot of confusion uh, and a vast array of political ideas that were popular for some time, particularly um, around a group called the Narodniks, which I'm gonna come on to explain. But I just, wanna, I just wanna say that the reason it's important for us to comment on the political confusion is because I think Lenin learned very early on in his life the necessity for correct political ideas and why that has to then be expressed in an organizational manner through a party. And I think that that's one of the main lessons of the Russian Revolution for us to study and, and learn from today. So the Tsarist regime was extremely oppressive and you had a layer of people called the Narodniks who, who could see, I would say, the complete backwardness of Russia. And, and they were made up mainly of, of young intellectuals, of students, and they looked at the peasantry, which was the overwhelming majority of people in Russia at the time. And the peasantry were really the most downtrodden and oppressed layers in society. And they looked at them and they simply thought, these are the people who are going to lead the revolution in Russia. And in some respects, you could say that this showed a healthy instinct, but I would say it was just that, it was a knee-jerk rea reaction without any deeper understanding or analysis of the situation. And so they tried to just simply immerse themselves into the peasantry. And the peasants didn't really respond to this. And in many cases treated a lot of their propaganda and the acts that they, that they did with suspicion and hostility. And they distrusted a lot of what they did. 
And as a result, all they really ended up doing was assassination attempts um, against the Tsar, the first of which was unsuccessful. But they did do a second, uh, they did uh, attempt an assassination that was successful that resulted in the death of the Tsar. But this action didn't um, inspire the peasants to kind of take up the struggle. And in fact, all that happened was heightened state repression um, after, the, after the death of the Tsar, particularly against the intelligentsia. And that is, I would say, the product of terrorist actions. The lesson for us here is that individual terrorism really only reinforces the power of the state. And the reason I bring this up is because Lenin's older brother uh, was actually a part of this intelligentsia, this kind of group layer of society. And due to his role in the assassination of the Tsar, he was killed. And I, and I would say that the execution of his brother um, obviously shook Lenin and would have had an impact on his life. And all of this contributes to his radicalization, but the growing radicalization of a lot of people in, in Russia at the time. There was all this anger against the Tsar that I would say created fertile ground for the establishment of reading circles. And then the impact of Marxist ideas saw, you know, amongst these reading circles and various other things, saw attempts to establish then a revolutionary Russian social democratic party. And it's in this time that um, Lenin is exiled after meeting Plekhanov, who's very considered the founder of Russian Marxism. And we see um, the first Congress of this Russian Social Democratic uh, Labour Party is held in 1898. But it must be said that although this was the first Congress, it was raided and the participants were arrested. So it wasn't the Congress in its fullest sense. Despite all this, at the end of uh, his exile, Lenin uh, moves to concentrate his efforts on the establishment of a Marxist newspaper, Iskra, which is the spark. Um, and in, in doing so, Iskra was really able to establish Marxism as the dominant force on the left. And the paper was smuggled back into Russia and was, was really used to unite um, a lot of these circles into a unified, in, on, on a unified base, a unified political and, and theoretical base. And it's also in this period that Lenin writes his, his famous pamphlet, What is to be Done? Uh, in which he argues um, for a party, a party made up of professional revolutionaries uh, and of people dedicated to the cause. So in 1903, the second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party was held. But like I said, because the first one had been so disrupted, this really was the founding Congress. And it was here that the comrades of Iskra around this, this paper established themselves as the dominant trend in the party. However, an open split uh, took place late in the proceedings over organizational questions between Lenin and someone called Martov. And they were both editors of Iskra at that time. And the majority around Lenin became known as the Bolsheviks and the minority around Martov as the Mensheviks. And whilst there weren't clear political disagreements at that time, these then developed later on. And Lenin actually did attempt to reconcile these two factions for some time, but failed. And he later characterized that split as an anticipation of later, more important differences, which we're gonna come on to later. Nevertheless, the Bolsheviks in comparison to wider society at this time were still very small in numbers at this stage. And this is important to know going into the 1905 revolution, which I'm gonna talk about now. When talking about the Russian revolution, um, Trotsky actually described it as an act of, in three parts, the first of which being the 1905 revolution, um, the second being in, in February of 1917, and the third in October of 1917. But we're going to start just by briefly, you know, mentioning the, the 1905 revolution where the masses were really in struggle and the workers movement reached a peak. And the reason that this is really important for Marxists to, to study and to recognize and talk about is because the 1905 revolution demonstrated in practice the crucial role the working class plays in changing society. At this time, the workers set up Soviets, which are effectively workers' councils. And Lenin recognized these Soviets as the embryo of workers' rule and workers' control. But the revolution lacked political leadership and ultimately failed. And, and, the, and the defeat of the 1905 revolution um, was subsequently followed by a period of ruthless reaction from the Tsarist state um, and the police and the repression that was implemented subsequently. And, and the reason that, again, it's important for us to talk about these things and the lessons that we can learn from it is that I think we have to, to know that there is 
there is no straight road to revolution, right? It's not a linear process that's that's laid out in front of us. And there, there are constant ebbs and flows in the movement. And this, this takes a lot of time. Um, but also consciousness can change very rapidly just because things seem to be at an ebb for a certain amount of time doesn't mean that uh, the situation won't transform. And that is exactly what we see in Russia from 1905 all the way up to 1917 um, and, and the revolution that took place eventually. And so after 1905, there's this intense reaction from the Tsarist state against revolutionaries, of course, in particular, um, but also in general against the working class, trying to punish them for what they've tried to do. And Lenin takes this time quite seriously. I mean, you know, you, you'd be forgiven for thinking, was, you know, wouldn't, shouldn't Lenin have been, um, you know, kind of deep underground fighting the Tsarist state and doing everything he could in order to build up the forces of Marxism? And he was doing that, but you can do that in different ways. The reason I bring this up is because during this period in 1909, Lenin was actually in London. Um, he wasn't in Russia. And 1909 is when he, he wrote and published one of his uh, most famous and important works on philosophy, materialism and imperial criticism. And the reason he did that is because he recognized, and Lenin, has all, has all, you know, Lenin always recognized, sorry, the need for political clarity. And actually taking time to achieve political clarity is a prerequisite for strengthening the workers' movement. And so he took the time to do that. And I think that's an important um, important element of, of Lenin's life um, to recognize and uh, for us to take that on board in, in the way that we work today and what we're trying to build. So as I said there was this intense reaction after 1905 but this didn't last forever the workers weren't subdued forever and actually when it comes to around 1912 we see a huge strike wave develop and the workers movement once again begins to rise and the workers are gaining more confidence again showing this transformation of consciousness in relatively short amount of time. However, that rise is then cut across by the outbreak of the war um, in 1914. And it's important for us to just take a moment to recognize this because this was really a demoralizing time for revolutionaries uh, across the world, not just in Russia um, and for the working class in Russia. And, that, and that's because when the war started, you know, you, you had this situation where all the so-called Marxists who had been a part of the Second International at that time, and they had all sworn, you know, before to never support a war um, of working class people against working class people. And yet once the war was announced, all of them fell behind um, and supported their own bourgeois governments. And, and, and so this was a huge demoralizing time for, for revolutionaries and the forces of Marxism in general which were now completely isolated across the world. And Lenin, therefore Lenin actually called for the creation of a new workers international because you know, revolutionary prospects at that time looked very dim. You know, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't very hopeful to be a revolutionary, let's say, whilst that was ongoing. Um, and what's really interesting is that all the way up to January, 1917, um, which obviously is coming into the year of the Russian revolution. In January, um, Lenin uh, is in Zurich, he's in Switzerland at the time. And he's addressing a small meeting of the Swiss Young Socialists at that time. And he says that although he knew the situation would eventually change, he didn't believe that he would actually live to see the revolution. And it's phenomenal to think that that was his thought process and that only one month later, what we would see is the Russian working class bring down the Tsar, overthrow Tsarism, this regime that had been in place for hundreds of years, and, and you know, bring about a situation of dual power. And within a year's time, only nine months later, Lenin would then be heading a government of people's commissars. But in the January of that year, he didn't believe he was going to live to even see the revolution. And I think that's a really important lesson for us as Marxists to recognize that consciousness can really change and develop very quickly. So how then did this happen? Um, what, what, the, what were the next steps? I think I just first want to say that, you know, we often say that war is the midwife of revolution. And I think the effects of the war in particular during this time on consciousness was a really important part of uh, the whole process in Russia, but also in other countries, um, particularly in Europe around the world at this time. And so in February, we see the second act of the revolution as described um, by Trotsky. 
And the way it actually starts is on the it's on the 8th of March, which some of you might recognize as International Women's Day. And that's because the way the February Revolution started was with uh, women textile workers who who went on strike. They wanted to go on strike. And what's interesting is that the Bolsheviks actually opposed it at that time. They, their, their advice was not to go on strike, but they ignored this, um, were fed up and angry um, and marched out into the towns. And, and this quickly spread throughout different layers of the working class um, and became a very powerful force. And the February Revolution is what then um, overthrew the Tsar and the, and the Tsarist state. And what's interesting about comparing February to October, which we'll obviously come on to, is that in, in February, the Bolsheviks did not have a majority, um, uh, didn't, you know, they didn't have a majority on the Soviets, these workers' councils that had developed in, you know, amongst the working class. The Mensheviks did, which I described earlier, came from this split in Iskra that, that Lenin had been a part of. And so because the Bolsheviks did not have a majority of the Soviets, they didn't have any real leadership over the working class at that point despite the fact that the Tsar had just been overthrown, a provisional bourgeois government was put in place. And I think this is really significant, the fact that you had a situation where there were organs of workers' power that existed, and it was thanks to the working class that the Tsar had been overthrown in the first place, Not nothing to do with the bourgeois. Um, so workers overthrow, they have their own state, state structure in the form of Soviets that had developed these workers' councils, and yet the leaders of those Soviets, which were the Mensheviks, gave power to the bourgeois in the form of the provisional government. Um, and, and that's really where we see, um, and, and Lenin, you know, at this time is, is kind of losing his mind, I would imagine. Um, he's not in Russia in February, he's still in Zurich. And he's scouring the newspapers for the latest news from Russia. And when he saw that the Soviets, which were led by the Mensheviks, as I explained, had handed power to the provisional government, he was furious and you know, immediately recognized the need to return to Russia and, and make sure that the Bolsheviks didn't capitulate and support the provisional government, which wasn't going to liberate the working class and it wasn't the steps that needed to be taken. And some of the Bolsheviks on the more conservative side were getting caught up in the euphoria of the February revolution and offering some form of support to the provisional government, including Stalin and Kamenev at this time. And uh, Lenin telegraphs them and warns them against supporting the provisional government. Because we have to recognize that once the provisional government was in place, the Soviets hadn't disappeared. They didn't, these workers' councils, these forms, organs of workers' power didn't just dissolve immediately. They were still there. And so Lenin returns to Russia on the 3rd of April in 1917 and puts forward his April thesis um, that a second, a second Russian revolution must take place and it must be the step towards a world socialist revolution. And he comes out against the old guard, um, of the Bolsheviks who are lagging behind the situation. And he really begins his fight to rearm the Bolshevik party. And he says no support to the provisional government and all power to the Soviets. And these are the kind of famous slogans that came out of that period. And at this time, Lenin was in a minority of one, and he was having to fight against the old guard of the Bolsheviks to get this message across. And Lenin put forward these demands because of this situation of dual power, where you had the Soviets and the provisional government, two classes in society with power balancing. This is a situation that cannot just go on indefinitely. Because this provisional government was supporting the war. It was tied to the bourgeoisie. It was not a, a government working in the interests of working class people. And Lenin was consistently calling on the Soviets that were still dominated by the Mensheviks to break with the capitalist ministers to take power, but they stubbornly refused to do so. And that inability then of the Menshevik leadership to connect with the working class and this developing mood is eventually what leads to their, their downfall because the subsequent Bolshevik slogans that came out, bread, land and peace, all power to the Soviets, won rapid support amongst the masses. And there are mass demonstrations in June that reflect this shift. So moving into June, um, the June days of the revolution, it becomes clear that the Bolsheviks had won over, I would say, a decisive section of workers and soldiers, particularly in the Russian capital and Petrograd. Uh, and they also commanded considerable support in Moscow, um, in the provinces, and also among soldiers who were on the front line. 
but the problem was, of course, the Mensheviks um, had no intention of taking power or even being accountable to, to, the, to the revolutionary organizations of workers and soldiers. And more than anything, again, Lenin is, re is seeing this situation of dual power that needs to be resolved. But the bourgeoisie could also see this, and they're starting to regain confidence in this part in this period. It's been some time now since February, a few months later. So they begin to lean on the leader of the provisional government, Kerensky, who is whipped up against them, um, calling them German agents. And this forces Lenin and Zinoviev into hiding. Um, and we also see the arrest of Trotsky, Kamenev, Kolontai, and other Bolshevik leaders at this time. And following this, Kerensky issues a series of oppressive measures against the Russian masses as well. Hundreds of arrests are made and the death penalty is reintroduced for dissidents on the front line. And so what we see is the bourgeoisie has regained its confidence and takes an even more open counter-revolutionary position. They're trying to crush the working class now and crush um, the, the mood of the February Revolution and how that had inspired the masses. And this, this confidence um, galvanizes and, and crystallizes, I suppose, around a general called Kornilov, um, who became the head of the army. And in this period, then, we see Bolshevik centers are raided, printing presses are destroyed, um, arrest warrants are issued for Lenin, Kamenev, Zinoviev, who'd all been driven into hiding, as I'd said. And Kornilov, who at first had been kind of ambiguous towards Kerensky, kind of seeing the provisional government as maybe something it could work with, maybe not, gains more confidence. And so on the 24th of August, he just formally declares war on the provisional government on behalf of one wing, I suppose, one section of the bourgeoisie at that time. They really just wanted to go all out and crush the revolution. And so he orders his troops to march on Petrograd um, and boast, and he's boasting about how he's gonna deal with the revolution. And, and then once this happens, Kerensky and the Mensheviks actually realize that they're not gonna defeat this, this, uh, this reaction from Kornilov without the help of the Bolsheviks. Um, and it's interesting during this period then, you know, a delegation is actually sent to visit Trotsky in his cell to ask his advice. Should they support Kerensky against Kornilov or fight both? And Trotsky advises them to postpone their reckoning with Kerensky, really. Uh, and Lenin says the same thing. At the same time, Lenin is arguing that the Bolsheviks should use Kerensky as a gun rest against Kornilov. Um, and what's interesting is I have, a, I have it here. Lenin wrote a letter to the Central Committee at the beginning of September in 1917. And he says, we shall fight. We are fighting against Kornilov, but we do not support Kerensky. We are uncovering his weaknesses. This distinction is rather delicate, but highly important and must not be forgotten. So they maintain an independent position against Kornilov, but give no support to the provisional government. And, and this is really important because in the process, they reveal the complete weakness of the provisional government, the complete weakness of the reformists um, and the weakness of the Mensheviks as well. And they, they demonstrate to the workers that only the Bolsheviks could effectively fight the counter revolution. So the Bolsheviks mobilize the workers against Kornilov using revolutionary methods. And uh, this really you know, makes it clear in the minds of the workers who the Bolsheviks are and their role in defending the working class and defending the revolution. You know, the Kornilov revolt in general gave a mighty impetus to the revolution. And like I said, it clarified the political situation in the minds of many of the workers. And as a result of this, I would say, is how the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Soviets. And it's all of this work then that sets them up and allows them to take power in October 1917, um, 1917 the third act, as, as Trotsky described. Of the of the Russian of the Russian Revolution, and again the Bolsheviks. Lenin had to, to change the line of the Bolsheviks after coming in April for all of this to happen, which again shows the role that he played. And so, at this time, um, entering into October, the beginning, the kind of early days of October, Lenin is actually in hiding still in Finland, and he's becoming very impatient with the Bolshevik leaders and, and fears that they're dragging their feet. Um, he says, events are prescribing our task so clearly for us that procrastination is becoming positively criminal. And he said, to wait would be a crime to the revolution. And so in October, the Central Committee of the Bolsheviks take the decision to take power, um, actually against the votes of Zinoviev and Kamenev. Um, and, and Trotsky insists that the date then of the insurrection should be timed to coincide with the opening of the Congress of Soviets, these workers' council, these workers' bodies that um, had been set up. 
And in doing so, the Bolsheviks would win, you know, the majority of the executive committee of this Congress of Soviets, and therefore would be acting with the full authority of the Soviets, who have the authority of the working class, which comprise, you know, it's it's their way to actually win the authority and 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 work with the workers in that in that sense. And so Trotsky, who was um, head of the Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet at that time, acts swiftly um, to ensure the smooth transfer of power on the 25th of October. So I just want to end by giving a, a bit of a description of to how then the seizure happened and how the Bolsheviks actually took power um, in, in around the 25th then. So there had been rumours of, of an imminent uprising against Kerensky and the provisional government for some time. Um, but the Bolshevik leadership was still wavering slightly. And, but Kerensky is getting panicked, he's getting nervous, so he begins to move against the left. Uh, he's still trying to raid their printing offices and just prevent them from, from doing their political activity. And the Bolshevik Central Committee meets and it just lays out its plans to ensure that there's sufficient Bolshevik control over communications, transport, food channels in and out of Petrograd um, in the event of, this, of the uprising. But some of the Bolshevik leadership is, is trying to be cautious. Stalin actually, actually um, published an editorial where he called for mass pressure to be put on Kerensky rather than an armed overthrow. But by now, the masses had moved beyond these tactics and the situation was developing a logic of its own. And, you know, whether the Bolsheviks were going to be ready or not, the time had really come. And so Kerensky spends the day um, desperately organizing with his military staff to try and dispatch loyal troops, um, bring them out from the front line and bring them back um, to, to the capital to defend the provisional government. But he barely has any people who are willing to come and do this. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviks have um, the support of huge sections of the working class. Kerensky has this panicked meeting with Parliament where he tries to seek endorsement of emergency measures to again suppress the left, but this doesn't really go to plan, he doesn't get them through, and he, he gives a, a very rambling, described as emotional speech um, that seems, seems, comes across as very hysterical, and that is his last public address in Russia. So I think sensing that the situation is hopeless, the guards at the Winter Palace actually abandon their posts they just kind of give up they're like okay, I'm not going to do this um, and in the military revolutionary committee that's been set up seizes the Petrograd telegraph office um, the electric stations and there's meetings being held in all you know working class districts of the capital um, and they are they're producing expressions of support for the Petrograd Soviet and its program and what's interesting is that despite this quite frantic activity that is happening on the surface, many things were surprisingly calm in that restaurants, casinos, cinemas and theatres all stayed open whilst this was um, ongoing. Lenin um, is in hiding initially, but becomes frustrated at the situation and being separated from the workers at this most critical juncture and decides he can wait no longer. And so he actually he gets a wig, he bandages up his face and he and he leaves to join it, despite the, um, the what the Bolshevik Central Committee had actually asked him to do at that time. And so you had sailors who were loyal to the Soviets. They occupied the state bank. Um, Bolshevik soldiers are seizing the telephone station. Um, and you can just see the Bolsheviks winning with, in conjunction, the workers taking control of all these all of these uh, sections of society. And so the Military Revolutionary Committee develops a plan to take the Winter Palace. Um, they'll offer the government an opportunity to, to surrender, but if it refused, they would shell the palace, um, which obviously in the end doesn't need to happen um, because everyone kind of removes themselves from their posts uh, and, and doesn't isn't able to resist and doesn't try to resist. And so Trotsky opens an emergency session of the Petrograd Soviet and he announces on behalf of the Military Revolutionary Committee, I declare that the provisional government no longer exists. And Lenin arrives and he stands beside Trotsky and he also addresses the crowd saying, the workers and peasants revolution has occurred and this is the beginning of a new period in the history of Russia. And, you know, the, the, I'm sure the mood was quite electric. It's even quite powerful reading those statements now. And the second all Russian Congress then of the Soviets is held and the Bolsheviks win this clear majority. And in protest, the Mensheviks actually just storm out and walk out. Uh, and Lenin just addresses the Congress and he, he says to all the, the delegates, we will proceed to construct the socialist order. And in a matter of days, 
decrees are then issued by uh, Lenin's government on peace proposals, the abolition of secret diplomacy, land to the toilers, the right of nations to self-determination, workers' control, right of recall over all representatives, full equality of men and women, and on the complete separation of church from the state. And so it is what I said at the beginning, the beginning of the socialist reconstruction of society. And I'm just going to come towards an end now because I'm coming to the end of my 30 minutes. But I just want to end by saying that one of the main features of a revolutionary situation is the suddenness with which the mood of the masses can change. And that is really clear, I think, when we study Russia and, and many other revolutions, as hopefully you'll see if you, stay, if you stick with us for this series, because the workers learn very quickly on the basis of events. And a revolutionary tendency, I would say, can experience explosive growth, passing from a tiny minority into a decisive force. But that's on one condition, which is that it combines flexible tactics with implacable firmness on all political questions. You know, at the beginning, Lenin was derided by his opponents as a hopeless sectarian. And this completely transforms and the, the tide flows very strongly um, towards the direction of Bolshevism over the course of 1917. And so what I would say to anyone now, all Marxists, is that a political party that is steeped in Marxist theory, you know, what we saw in, in Russia with the Bolsheviks, that political party was able to connect with this mass revolutionary movement that developed and adapt to the changes in consciousness. And it's that example and that lesson and that inspiration that I think we have to take as Marxists today in our fight to overthrow capitalism. And I'll leave it there for now. That was amazing. Thank you, Fiona. Um, yeah, I thought that was a really, really good uh, full um, lead off to like, um, really get into grips with some of the key ideas. We've already had quite a lot of um, quite a lot of uh, interesting questions. And I want to start with one from the um, Facebook live stream, because it actually just um, brings in the point that you were talking about at the end there, Fiona. Um, so somebody on the Facebook live stream asked, um, asked why did Lenin argue that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Um, so obviously, you've just kind of covered that with like talking about um, talking about the uh, the situation of the Bolsheviks and the fact that they were so steeled in revolutionary um, in revolutionary theory and understanding. And this was why uh, why they made the successes that they did. But is there anything else you want to um, you want to speak about more about that question? Um, well, I mean, I could come back now, but maybe we should bring other people in first. I was just thinking just because I spoke for quite a while. <laughs> um, Maybe, yeah, those kind of questions I could do at the end, but if someone wanted to... Yeah. To, uh, well, we have a few people have got their hands raised, so I'm going to bring in um, Mick, because he had his hand raised first. Um, sure. So, Mick, if you just want to come in as a panellist and then you can speak. Let's see how well this works. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Mick. Hi, Nick. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, Mick, we can't hear you. So we might have to. I'm gonna. We might have to ask someone else to come in. Bit, sorry, and bring um, bring in uh, Jack Wilson. But feel uh, free to raise your hand again, Mick, if you if you figure out your your mic and your your camera. <laughs> Jack. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see you. But that's okay. Mm, I'm not sure why that is. How about now? Oh, there we go. Hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Jack I'm from the Leeds Marxist Society. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say um, it was a great lead off. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so throughout um, your lead off, you sort of uh, mentioned a few times this like idea of the importance of um, within the Revolutionary Party of, of Lenin's idea of building a vanguard party. And I just sort of wanted to elaborate on like some of the, um, on that a little bit, because I think it's impossible to sort of separate the, um, the, the revolution itself from the sort of really like long process of developing the party. And um, I think it's striking to actually think of how many times the Bolshe Bolsheviks were actually on the brink of, of, of collapse effectively due to repression under the Tsar's regime and everything. Um, 
this was particularly the case at the start of World War One, just before 1917. Um, so they were initially quite strong, but like the um, the the Tsar's regime basically doubled down on the Bolsheviks. They saw that they were the most radical um, of of the different sort of left wing groups in Russia at the time, and they were decimated by arrests and exiles. And um, effectively, all communication and all of the party structures were were just were just gone. They vanished um, because, and, and as well as that, the advanced workers, you know, they were mobilized into the war effort, and they were isolated in the army. And I think something that really that's really poignant is that um, Lenin didn't actually receive any communications from the from the Russian Bolsheviks from the Bolsheviks in Russia for months, um, for months whatsoever. But I think, um, and, and obviously as well as that, the fact that they were internationally isolated as well. Like as you mentioned, uh, the, the, the second international had uh, betrayed the working class. Um, but despite the fact that they were so sort of um, they were in a, such a struggling position at this point. Thanks to the sort of long and patient work, the unspectacular work, you could say, of you know patiently building cadres, cadres of uh, educating yourself in Marxist ideas, um, and, of, and you know of clarifying um, of ideas as well, of having polemics um, in in the movement, they were able to regroup themselves, and um, you know within within three years they were able to lead a lead a revolution, you know when the time uh, when the time came. So I guess with that in mind, um, I'd like to ask. Um, what do you think that Marxists should do, Marxists and, and socialists should do today in order to be prepared for a revolu revolutionary situation in the future? Cheers. Thanks, Jack. I'm going to demote you again. Um, bye. Bye, Jack. Yeah. Do we want to come back to questions at the end or do we want to? Do we want to answer that now? It's up to you, Fiona. Um, well, I guess I'll just, oh, sorry, I just need to cough. <clears throat> I guess I'll just say, it was a very polite cough, um, that, you know, what should Marxists be doing? Uh, I think the question was, what should Marxists be doing to prepare for revolution? Uh, is, that, is that an accurate question? Um, and I think that, well, I mean, one of the things, obviously, is to study the revolutions of the past, right? And and have a, have a good grip on theory. Um, which is which is what we're trying to do now, I suppose. What the MSF is attempting to build um, by having these discussions. But and hopefully, I can I can answer the the question that Sarah said came from the live stream earlier on, you know, expanding really on on Lenin's statement that what is the important, you know, why is revolutionary theory necessary, um, and that you you know theory is an important element of this work and the work that we're trying to do, and that's because. I said in the in the lead off that there's no straight line to revolution, there's no straight path, and that there are constant ebbs and ebbs and flows. And you know, I think there's lots of examples in history we can point to that show this. And really, I would say that theory is what orients people through the the ebbs and flows of the movement. Um, you know, in in 1909, Lenin writes this great philosophical um, piece, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, fighting against the, the these ideas at the time and and this is whilst there's this you know intense and I'm sure everyone else feels it whenever there's a kind of defeat of the working class as Marxists one of the things that kind of steals us the most is when you know we read the theory and understand it and give ourselves a sense of proportion I would say more than anything and a sense of perspective of the fact that this is part and parcel of the process towards revolution and uh, it guides us therefore and and keeps us kind of um, steeled, I would say, in the movement, and so that we don't give in and, and support to the provisional government, for example, abandoning theory and abandoning the perspective that theory gives us and allows us to have moving forward. And I think that um, these discussions, and also not just discussions, actually reading and getting to grips with the theory yourselves. We run a lot of reading groups, for example, on various Marxist texts, uh, because you need to understand that for yourself as a, as a revolutionary in order to adapt to the, to the situations that take place once a war starts, things that can really throw people off. It's that grounding in Marxist theory that allows us to maintain, I would say, our perspective um, and our sense of proportion on what is happening and what is what are the steps that we need to take moving forward. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Fiona. We've got loads more um, really good questions. Um, so I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about somebody um, Somebody anonymous asked, how do we make sure that um, 
how do we make sure that Marxists uh, have the right leadership um, so that we can make sure the future of the revolution is successful and what can we learn from Lenin and the Bolsheviks? Um, and I think that question is kind of answered with um, with the point about theory uh, to me. Like, I think that the key to um, the key to making sure that we have a, um, a leadership that genuinely can lead the revolution, that can genuinely um, that can genuinely help to overthrow capitalism um, and create this world that we uh, that we all want, um, is about the understanding, and that is part of why we, um, as I said before, like part of why we have these talks, um, so that we can um, so that we can uh, understand the um, the lessons of the past, uh, learn from them, and move forward. Um, and make sure that we uh, that we take on all of the um, all of the positives. Learn uh, learn everything from from the greats of Lenin and uh, of Lenin and Trotsky and um, like many many others. And um, and being able to use that to uh, to actually um, to actually help lead the coming revolution, which will be slightly different. And we have to understand like uh, all of the all of the theoretical um, facts of Marxism. But we also have to make sure that. We aren't just um, understanding it in this like abstract academic way, but that we're actually, as a leadership, like involved in the movement, and that we are actually um, helping to fight uh, alongside with um, with these um, with these workers for the demands that they're um, that they're asking for right now. And um, so I think what I would say is like uh, what we learn from the Bolsheviks, especially as this question asks, is that the fight starts now. Like Lenin and Trotsky didn't pop up in 1917 as Fiona laid out like this had been a struggle that had been going on for a long time and um, that we uh we need to start like laying the groundwork now to be a genuine revolutionary leadership that can do the job that we ask of ourselves um yeah so uh, i just want to say that i think that everyone should be able to see the q a function so if anybody sees any questions that they would like to um that they would like to answer um, and is in this Zoom call, then put your hand up and I'll bring you in to like answer any other questions because it doesn't have to be just Fiona all of the time. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, Fiona, is there anything on here that you uh, that you want to answer now? Um, or do you want me to uh, bring in a question from the live stream? Or? Uh, well, what's the question on the live stream? Um, well, <laughs> um, give me a second. Uh, there's a question, um, what's the difference between uh, Stalinism and Bolshevism, which I think is a very good question that we should be discussing. Yeah, um, that is a, a very good question that we should discuss. It's also a very big question, I would say. Um, so I'll give a, a kind of a, a small answer <laughs> for now, but I would encourage people to read a lot of our material that we've produced on, on the topics. Um, but the first thing I would say that the essence of Stalinism really is a lack of faith in the working class. And in some respects, you can you can see that in, in the way Stalin was you know, lagging behind events in a lot of the, in a lot of, the, in a lot of what was happening, you know, from February to October, um, not, you know, you know, advising against an armed overthrow that we should be putting pressure on Kerensky instead, um, and you know, giving support. I just want to clarify something. So when the when the provisional government came into place, Stalin and Kamenev supported the provisional government in the sense that they would support the provisional government if it was. Uh, fighting in the interests of the working class. But of course, the provisional government was not doing that. So their support for the provisional government was still wrong. And when we when we talk about Stalinism, although, you know, in, 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 in essence, it started with Stalin and his role and the, the degeneration, I would say, of the Soviet Union that happened subsequently, it's not just about Stalin as an individual and his character. I think when we we, we should think about Stalinism also in the labor movement today in terms of tactics and the way it, it presides and pre presents itself because it is in essence a lack of faith in the working class. It's maneuvering. It's not being able to have the political debate and have the discussion. And this is what, how Stalin acted. Stalin couldn't win the debate over the Bolsheviks. Stalin's 
kind of uh, performance, if you will, um, after the death of Lenin and, and, and once he took over and he was in charge was, you know, through purges, it was through um, maneuvers, it wasn't through uh, debate or, or any kind of democratic means, that's for sure. And, 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 that, and I think we see that echoed in different, in different situations throughout history and also in, in some aspects of the, of the labor movement today. And that is what we should fight. Bolshevism on the other hand, is based on, on democracy and it's based on theory and it's based on, on the legacy of, of what we saw the Bolsheviks have. Bolshevism and Leninism are, are quite similar in that, you know, when Lenin returned to Russia in April, in a minority of one, he had to raise those slogans and those demands and won over then the majority of the Bolsheviks and the rank and file on the need to, to put forward those slogans and why they shouldn't support the provisional government. And that is the legacy that we, we, we want to inherit, of course, from the Russian Revolution. Stalinism, um, which develops in its fullest, in a fuller sense, uh, you know, obviously after uh, Lenin's death and the kind of the, the years moving into the Soviet Union. But I would also just add that the there was a material basis for Stalinism and the degeneration of the, the Russian Revolution and the Soviet Union as a whole, which was the material conditions that Russia was in at the time um, and its isolation at the time and its backwardness. Um, but that, you know, is obviously a, a whole discussion in and of itself that um, that can be had a, in a different in a different time. I don't think I can talk about the degeneration of the Soviet Union just now, but hopefully that um, you know answers some of that question. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm just gonna um, bring in Keelan to speak um, because he has his hand raised. Um, get away from us for a second. Hi, Keelan. Hello. <laughs> wow, Keelan's got a new haircut for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which well, is it a bit, you know? <laughs> Uh, and it was, yeah, courtesy of my flatmate, Nick, who's just like coming through and he's really proud. And here, here he is. I can do everything. I can even cut hair. I'm joining okay. the room, guys. Okay. So, so um, yeah, I wanted to answer the question on, um, on basically on the Second World War. So someone asked a, a question that was basically along the lines of like, you know, would we um, kind of attribute the sort of same uh, phenomena uh, to the f uh, Second World War as we would the first, like in a, a war of like imperialist aggression and kind of was, was it not kind of fair that we, we fought against fascism? Um, I think it's still, I think like as Marxists, we would still characterize the Second World War as an imperialist war. And I think it's important to make the point that uh, Britain and France did not intervene um, on the basis of any kind of humanitarian principle when it decided to kind of defend um, Poland's national sovereignty, right? Like that wasn't a principal position for them. They were concerned about the growth of, of German imperialism at the end of the day, just as they um, 21 years before why they why the, the first world war happened it was still a sort of uh, you know the capitalist classes of Britain and France deciding that this was going way too far essentially um, and of course this these were capitalist classes that had been uh, willing to to back uh, the Nazis right the way through the 1930s uh, because they saw it as a, as a strong uh, defense against the, the Soviet Union um, and saw the project of fascism as a positive force uh, in uh, German society because it precisely because it played the role of destroying uh, the workers movements. But I think the position that Marxists uh, took during the Second World War, uh, as anyways, Marxists that um, that weren't um, Stalinists, I think that the Stalinists played their own role. And I don't necessarily have the time to go into, into, into that, but the position that like genuine Marxists took um, was the position that, you know, we should uh, overthrow uh, the ruling class in our own country, overthrow the British ruling class, and fight the war on the basis of, of workers' control over uh, the means of production in the workers' government. So, you know, the, uh, and, and there were comrades at the time um, who raised uh, the, the, the kind of position of um, first Hitler, then Churchill, and this kind of thing. I think uh, that, would have, that would have been the basis. I think we would have still, even obviously, we would not say, like, take the position that the Stalinists did of a kind of meek uh, pacifism because of the Nazi Soviet pact, like we, like the, the war against fascism, was obviously a, a something that a lot of workers were in favor of, but they should have been given the leadership of that program. And I think you know, when you look at the mistakes that were made during the Second World War by the uh, a sort of uh, callous uh, ruling class, um, it, the, the, you you know, there's um, kind of like historical grounds for uh, the fact that you know the the war should have been planned by 
uh, workers who, for whom obviously were, were fighting that conflict, for who, who were um, putting the hours in factories, etc., rather than uh, basically allowing um, the bosses to dictate the course of the war, who, who dictated it in, in a way that served their interests, who took, made decisions that benefited uh, their, their primary interests and their imperialist interests as well. So I think that's kind of uh, the analysis we would have of the, of the Second World War, basically. Um, so I hope that's answered that question. Thank you. Sorry, in a bit. Thank you for coming in on that. Um, I'll just remove you. Um, okay, yeah, so I, uh, there's loads of really good questions in the Q&A, so I just wanted to answer um, this one asked by someone anonymously. Um, somebody asked, uh, historically capitalists will often resort to violence in order to crush a revolution. And should we be learning military tactics as well as political theory? So I think this is a really, again, like, I, sorry, I keep saying, I think this is a really good question. Like there are all really good questions. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think that um, this is a, definitely a question worth answering. I wanna answer it um, in as much as I can. Um, so I think uh, we shouldn't take any sort of, um, any sort of light approach to violence, we shouldn't consider it something um, something frivolous and uh, and um, just to like make ourselves look like more Marxists, like carrying uh, carrying guns and weapons and stuff for the sake of it. Um, but I think that uh, this this point that capitalists um, often resort to violence is uh, is exactly correct. Like we've seen um, we've seen in almost every revolutionary movement in every militant strike, the miners' strike is a good example, um, where the uh, the state um, who holds the power of violence um, will, will try and smash the workers' movement uh, with as much force and might as they need to do that. Um, and uh, and I think that that is definitely something that we have to be realistic about. Um, the Peterloo massacre is a very good example of what not to do in this kind of situation, where the workers actually said, like we um, we think that we should take uh, weaponry, um, we think that we should take weaponry in. We think that we should be armed. Um, and the uh, the leadership um, of the movement at the time, uh, they um, they basically said. Uh, no, that, that's going to put people off. People are going to think that we're that we're these like militants, and we we don't want that to be the case. This is a, a simplification of what happened, but you know, um, and uh, and um, the, like a lot of people were killed um, and uh, and beaten up by the by the police, and um, and I think that that's like that's very important to understand, and we do have to be prepared for that kind of situation. We can't just um, we can't just like. Um, hope that nobody's going to, uh, that, the, that the state aren't going to come out with these kind of measures. Um, we know that capitalists are not willing to give up their money easily um, and they're not willing to give up all power easily. So we need to make sure that uh, we are we are ready for this um, and we are uh, yeah, we can defend our we can defend ourselves as a class when that becomes necessary. Um, I have another hand up from Khaled, so I'm gonna uh, gonna bring him in. Um, I don't know why it's not letting me get rid of Keelan. Um, <laughs> wait, gone. there we go. Um, Khaled will hopefully come up now and talk about something. Um, yeah, and if anybody's watching through the live stream and wants to ask a question, they're being sent to us uh, by people watching the live stream. So feel free to ask on there and we'll try and answer them. We have got a lot of questions though, and I don't want to keep you guys for way too long. And um, so we might not get through everyone's questions. I don't know, it's not brought Khaled up to be a panelist. So um, I'll just wait and see whether that, oh no, here we go. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> hey, am I on? You are. Yeah. Sorry about that, my phone, my phone jammed. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that lead off Fiona, that was excellent. And it reminded me of a quote that I came across in my reading of uh, Bolshevism, The Road of Revolution by Alan Woods. And it's a quote by Hegel. Uh, so I'm going to start with that. And he says, when you want to see an oak tree, we tend to be disappointed when we see an acorn instead. And I think that this is a sentiment that will really resonate with many people on the left today, because we're seeing all of these revolutionary upheavals throughout the world. You know, 2019 can be characterized as the world in revolt which makes the task of revolutionary socialists even greater. And I think, you know, we used to hark back to the example of the Arab Springs, but there's much fresher examples. But 
in the Arrow Springs, um, you know, it, it's testament to how power was really lying in the streets, ready for anyone to pick it up. But in the absence of a revolutionary party, we saw one dictatorship toppled and replaced by an ex. Um, and something that I found uh, in the talk that Fiona mentioned uh, was in this period of reaction following the 1905 revolution, there is actually similar levels of revolutionaries in Russia as we have of the membership of the MSF today, which is, <laughs> which is uh, I find really, really strange. Um, so I wanted to, to make two points about how I think we can cut across pessimism. But I think the first of this is to join us at the MSF and join us in our struggle for socialism. But I think the first is to understand that the class struggle is not some static thing, but it's actually a battle of living forces. You know, the political situation can be transformed and transformed again on the basis of events, as we're seeing with, with, within the Labour Party at the moment. Um, and this question of it being a battle of living forces, it reminds me of like in the late 1800s, when before the Bolshevik, uh, Bolsheviks were formed as a faction, we had the, these tendencies and the, like these ideas that were in the ascendancy at the time, the ideas of the economists and the legal Marxists, for example. Um, and I think the main idea, kind of the essence of this, is the idea that workers don't need theory. You know, they should, we should maintain that the agitation is just solely the bread and butter issues. And I think this, these strands of opportunism really reflect the pressures of bourgeois society um, and I, it was expressed in a, a piece by Bernstein, which Rosa Luxemburg writes a fantastic polemic against. But Plekhanov, on reading, you know, this idea that, you know, you can socially reform ca the capitalism part out of capitalism itself actually made him physically sick. And then you have this complete transformation in the situation where leading to the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Um, I think, secondly, uh, an emphasis on theory can be a real remedy to um, to kind of like this pessimism, uh, this idea that the left is on the back foot, because theory isn't some abstract thing that we take interest in from our armchair. But Marxists understand theory to be the living memory of the working class and therefore our guide to action. <clears throat> I think something that the MSF does is really place an emphasis uh, of theory and from, from these theoretical underpinnings of how the world is around us, we can really seek to change things. Um, and I think Lenin always maintained, from starting at the immediate problems of the working class, fighting for all kinds of partial reforms, it's necessary to go beyond the particular and establish a link with the general. From the struggle of workers' groups that can seem disparate at points against their individual bosses, this, to the struggle of, um, of the working class as a whole against the bourgeois and against its state. I think in this brilliant line of argument, Lenin really hammers home the interrelationship between uh, agitation, between propaganda and theory and explains how small forces of Marxism uh, by winning over the most advanced layers of the class can subsequently win over the mass of workers and through the latter, all the oppressed strata within society. And ultimately, this is the strategy alongside this emphasis on theory, um, the implacable theoretical clarity, which Lenin always drove that, was really vindicated in the monumental 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. That was great. Thank you for that, Carl. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, so... Um, I haven't got anyone with their hand up at the moment. Um, so just remember, if you do want to come in and speak, you're welcome to do that. Um, if nobody else wants to speak right now, though, um, and there's a couple of questions here about, um, uh, there's a couple of questions about um, the, the revolution in relationship to the fact that bourgeois, um, bourgeois commentators often refer to it as a coup and kind of how we would, um, argue against that. Um, I think the the most important point that uh, that is always um, always brought up for me in terms of this is like a coup on the basis of uh, on the basis of Soviets would not have been possible. Like this movement existed 
so much in society that um that a completely undemocratic uh, leadership taken over would not have uh, would not have been very successful um, and also if you read the uh, the historical um the historical like facts of the situation like whether or not um like whoever whoever you read from whether it's a, a marxist source or a bourgeois source um what you can see is that is that millions of people like flooded out onto the streets um in order to in order to fight in these revolutions and um, there were quotes from uh like um quote, like quotes from workers in the in the revolutionary situation in Russia at the time who talk about the um the huge like the huge enthusiasm on the streets and the huge level of uh, level of like excitement of people coming out into the movement and joining in and um, and from this you can really see like the fact that this this wasn't a coup by a few people at the top this was a movement um a movement that was very much uh that was very much um bottom bottom up a movement that uh that included workers that couldn't have been done without workers in any uh, in any way um and the other point that i would always make in terms of this is like if marxists were in the habit of um of really organizing coups then surely we would have done it a lot more often um the, the, like this idea that uh that Lenin and Trotsky would have um, would have uh, would have established a coup when they'd been fighting for workers' control. They'd been building the Bolshevik name in the Soviets, as Fiona um, spoke about. Uh, is really like quite incredible. Um, and then like incredible, yeah. And um, in my eyes, um, Fiona, is there anything you want to answer? I've got someone with their hand up. Yeah, but sure. Um, yeah, there was a few questions that I I wanted to answer, and yeah, I I love that coup thing it's like well if they did a coup then tell me how and I'll tell my comrades and we'll be at parliament on Monday that little joke um yeah so I was going to answer this question from someone uh, which is about uh, Kornilov and I think this is from a comrade uh, in America I'm assuming because they said they ask regarding opposing Kornilov uh, with no support for Kerensky in the provisional government, are there any parallels with um, the work of Marxists in the US? And in that they oppose Trump, but with no support for the Democrats. And they asked if I could just uh, expand on, on that idea a little bit. And I think that, you know, with Kornilov and the USA, there might be some kind of parallels, I suppose, when you first look at it. But uh, a big difference is that Trump isn't a fascist and we wouldn't characterize Trump as a fascist. Um, and I think a closer parallel that might make more sense is actually with Venezuela and, and, and the way we engage with uh, the, the Venezuelan revolution and how it happened and, and what's happening now, I suppose, which is that, you know, we don't support Maduro and his policies, which threaten to actually roll back the gains of the, Bolo of the Bolivarian revolution. But that doesn't mean that we don't direct our fire against US imperialism, for example, and the you know constant attempted, if we want to talk about coups, um, uh, attempts from the US to interfere with Venezuela and, and get rid of the democratically elected government there. We recognise, obviously, that Maduro's policies are rolling back the gains um, and, and the, the, what the working class fought for and won initially in the Venezuelan revolution. Um, but the, in, the, in the instance of a coup, for example, or these like imperialist attempts, we have to uh, uh, fight the US, fight the, the US imperialists and what they're trying to do in order to defend the revolution. And I think that's probably closer, um, a closer example to 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 Kornilov and Kerensky and fighting Kornilov using Kerensky as gun rest I like that phrase that that Lenin used that you know Kerensky is just gun rest in in, in the fight against against Kornilov because really the aim of a policy like that is to is to strengthen the authority of Marxism within the movement and that's what the Bolsheviks managed to do in that process they were able to uncover the uh, the weakness of Kerensky and the weakness of the Mensheviks um, and the inability rather of Kerensky to fight Kornilov and uh, the Bolsheviks also at that time were a much bigger force, a mass force, whereas today uh, the Marxists in the US I would say are not a ma uh, mass force and they're, they're quite small and so that is a, also a difference in how we might approach something like this um, but yeah that's what I would that's what I would say on that. Okay, cool. I'm going to try and um, bring someone in, but I've heard that their connection isn't very good. So if it doesn't work, then we'll just kick them straight back out again. But let's hope.
Maybe. Yeah. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, right, yeah, so um, my, name, my name's Ben, I'm from London. I was just gonna um, answer one of the questions that's been put in about uh, about these about the spark basically of the february revolution about the um the textile workers who went on strike uh one comrade has asked um <clears throat> why the bolsheviks kind of advised the textile workers not to go on strike and what is asked in the question there is um correct i think which is uh, what's mentioned there i think i think the reason was the Bolshe like it was the, Bol the bolsheviks were, were concerned basically for the workers that they were going to face the repression of the state and that they wouldn't find uh, general support amongst the rest of the class uh, for their action and therefore just be subjected to um, brutal repression basically. Um, <clears throat> now that in the, uh, the basically they misread the mood obviously of uh, in society at the moment. It's not though, um, it, it's not the, the, the worst crime in, in the world in the, in the sense that it's very, it's, it's impossible to predict the, the spark of a revolution um there's there's very few people who can point to a particular event a particular strike a particular uh you know repressive action by the state and it's always something accidental something like that which sparks off a revolution and none of us really can predict exactly what that is going to be what we can do is is understand the mood that exists in society in general and the mood of anger that might be bubbling up uh or bubbling beneath the surface if you like that is waiting for an expression and, and when when we see that kind of situation developing obviously then we should be on the lookout for things like a strike of textile textile workers had we been in russia in february 1917 or whatever that is um today whatever the uh, the equivalent is today uh that that's really our job so that that's what uh, that was the mistake if you like oh sorry i'm getting a phone call um can you still hear me kick him out <laughs> okay continue. Can you still hear me? Sorry, I, I got I got a phone call then. Um, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, in terms of um, like Marxist today, uh, is there any situation in which we would advise against a workers' strike? Um, that's that, that's uh, it is linked to this same question basically. Um, the job of Marxists and the job of the Bolsheviks in 1917 was to unite all the different layers of the working class, which of course are moving at different speeds. Everybody, the working class is not one homogenous mass. People draw different conclusions at different times. And uh, and what you need to do is, is get maximum unity of the class around the most radical uh, program possible, basically, and build uh, that kind of, um, that kind of alliance for those, for those ideas. So that's the job. It's not a question of opposing strikes uh like as individual things or anything like this it's a question of understanding the general trajectory of the class struggle there might be times for example i mean it's not we're not really in this time now because at this particular moment so i'm speaking from britain at this particular moment um there's a general forward march of the class consciousness is being churned up people are questioning things there's a lot of anger amongst the working class in general today and so strike action today is going to be a very uh you know the, the government is on the back foot it's going to be it's going to be a powerful thing. It's going to be a good thing. It's going to raise class consciousness. It's going to develop the struggle for socialism. But obviously, under other circumstances, such as a situation of uh, of repression, for example, uh, a situation where the class struggle is thrown backwards uh, in in a serious way, something that I, for example, I'm 28. I've never really, certainly in my political life, I've never really been in a situation like that. But in such a situation, if there was a group of workers who, who you might characterize, for example, as uh, like a small small number we might characterize as ultra left or basically just just wanting just champing at the bit to 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 strike out basically uh and, and agitating on that basis if it would result in in fracturing of the class in uh, in, a, in a clash between different wings of the working class in opening the way for uh, for repression which couldn't be resisted by the class then obviously you'd have to discuss whether that was the right tactical thing uh, to do um so it's not really a question of a po like uh, in an abstract way, opposing uh, or supporting strikes. It's about trying to develop the class struggle and build class consciousness and and, and and fight for socialism in that way. That's great. Thank you for answering that, Ben. And um, that was a really good answer. Um, I believe, Fiona, you wanted to answer some more questions from the Q&A. 
So yeah. there was one question I was just going to answer quickly. Um, I think we'll probably end the 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 meeting around um seven thirty. So I'll just answer it quite quickly. And it's because the person's said my question is to comrade Fiona and they use my name so I'm going to answer that now um, and they say that they're from Kerala and the, the question is um, so the questions and answers till now were on regarding the revolution so my question is about the democratic revolution how should we as Marxists try to make a change in every nation by taking part in the elections on a uh, by taking part in the elections on a practical level as we see the spur of fascism around the globe for the last 10 years. And I think this is a really um, is a really interesting and important question because it probably applies to the work of Marxists everywhere today um, in what they're doing. And I would just say that the, the struggle for basic democratic rights is a revolutionary fight uh, in a lot of countries all around the world. And actually as capitalism goes into crisis, that becomes the case even in countries such as Britain, uh, where you know the overthrow of the monarchy and the Lords is a democratic question. You know, it wasn't a short time ago where um, the our Parliament was prorogued and uh, the monarchy was used in in a, in a light that it typically isn't supposed to be used. Uh, the way the monarchy is is kind of dressed up in Britain is is that it doesn't actually really have any power. But we saw quite clearly um, before Christmas that the monarchy does have power um, and a lot of control over over politics and how the country is run obviously um, and we're seeing this more and more throughout the world right now I would say um, and so you know the question of the monarchy and the lords is a democratic question but it's one that can shake um, the entire regime as a whole and I would say that you know then what we saw in February in 1917 in Russia was a democratic revolution um, that overthrew the Tsar and got rid of them, got rid of the Tsar and the Tsarist regime. But Lenin explained the need to uh, complete the revolution by making it a step towards a socialist revolution, right? That's what he says in his letter when he's bidding farewell to the Swiss workers. He writes that the task of our, um, our task now must be to make this the first step um, in the prologue to the world socialist revolution or something like this, because ultimately it's only the working class that can solve these problems. Um, and without that in Russia, I think it's fair for us to say that with Kornilov, um, if Kornilov had won and the counter-revolution had won, uh, you would have had fascism. And so that kind of immortal phrase by Rosa Luxemburg on, on, on socialism or barbarism, I think is really, is really, was really clear in that moment. It was paramount. And that's becoming more relevant, I think, all over the world today in, in, the, in the most advanced capitalist countries, but also in, in the less advanced ones as well. So I just wanted to answer that question. Yeah, thank you for that, Fiona. Um, there's a question here that I wanted to answer um, about uh, the role of the youth in, um, in revolutionary movements. Um, and the comrade who asked us uh, has left a quote from Lenin, which I don't want to read out in full just because we have not that much time, but um, they just asked like, how important do we think the youth is in revolutionary movements? And I think like as the Marxist Student Federation, like this is something that we, uh, we should be answering because um, obviously we think it's quite important. Otherwise, we would uh, we wouldn't be um, we wouldn't be talking to students about these ideas. And um, I think uh, the youth um, the youth are often like the uh, the most radical um, layer of society in terms of the fact that they haven't uh, they haven't been beaten down by the defeats of the past. Um, and the youth are very very important um, in terms of uh, in terms of making sure that. Um, we can we can build a revolutionary movement long term, and and uh, and um, yeah overthrow uh, overthrow capitalism, um, and I think if you look at like the situation um, at the moment in Britain, um, and what the youth are doing, um, is is very exciting. Like if you look, um, well, firstly, like if you look at the sort of the Weatherspoons um, strikes and the McDonald's strikes and stuff, these are really good examples of um, mostly young workers who are coming out on these really militant strikes um, led by the Bakers Union, which is a very good union. Um, but these, uh, these people have, um, have, uh, have had these incredible, like, very militant strike, um, strike movements in the last couple of years. Um, and I think that's been really powerful to watch. And I think also in terms of um, even younger than that, if we think about the climate movements that have been going on over the last year and a half, um, the climate movements, are the, the youth of the youth, I've seen like, uh, I've seen people in primary school, like up to the age of 11, um, taking over the climate strikes and um, talking really like 
uh, really impressively about politics and about what we what we need and how we need a revolutionary movement, how we need a change in society. And that is like the key to, um, that's the key to the movement is being able to, uh, being able to um, build these people into, into true Marxist revolutionaries and um, getting them to help us overthrow capitalism. Um, yeah, Fiona, is there anything else you wanna answer from the Q and A or? Um... I could probably do one more question and then we can like bring bring it to a close I suppose um hold on there was a question here that I was going to answer um yeah the question was about what can you tell us about workers democracy and workers control after the October revolution um because obviously we didn't really go into that and like I said I'm not gonna explain the the whole degeneration of the Soviet Union here um but just on this question on workers democracy because I think it's an important one as it's a demand obviously that we raise um today um as as Marxists and I would say that the structures for workers' control were there um, in Russia at that time. Uh, but of course, they faced enormous difficulties due to the war and then also the civil war that took place uh, very quickly after the revolution. And the important thing for us to, to note is that democracy is based on material reality and, uh, and people's needs and, and not just the means to, to control society, um, which is you know, what the Soviets obviously had, but also the time and and what was taking place by then and this really is the is the root of all of our analysis of the Soviet Union and Russia which was what was the material conditions that they were they were in in order to even implement these structures and, and the policies that they wanted to do but despite that there were decrees that were implemented limiting wage differentials for example and providing Soviet control over workplaces and later on nationalizing industry and all of this took effect and also I just say that you did have um, you had workers control in the Red Army with the commissars who were Soviet representatives who exercised control over the Red Army um, over the Red Army uh, generals to guarantee that the army wouldn't be used against the revolution for example um, and yeah so I just wanted to give that example there to answer that short question but it obviously is a is something that requires a lot more um, a lot more discussion and a lot more could be said yeah so I think we're gonna close up there then um, but I think that's been a really fantastic discussion we were a bit worried about how well it would work um, via zoom um me and Fiona <laughs> pressing all day but it seems to have uh, it seems to have worked really well so thank you to the people who came in um and answered uh, and answered specific questions or made points and thank you to all the questions in the q a i'm sorry that we couldn't answer all of them we just got like so many really full questions that would take we could do like a um a talk on each one of these questions i reckon um but obviously we don't have that kind of time um mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, thank you for everyone um, for asking them anyway. Um, and if you are, uh, if we haven't answered your question, um, feel free to message um, message the Marxist Student Federation and ask the question. Um, and hopefully, we can send you some information. Um, Fiona, is there anything you want to say before we like wrap up, and then I can? Yeah, yeah um, I just kind of want to end by saying, you know. I we often say that the Russian Revolution was the greatest event in human history. And hopefully I've explained and described some of the reasons as to why that's the case. But we should make the point that we don't study history from an academic point of view, from the point of view of bourgeois historians, whether you know um, Lenin repels us or not, I think is what, is what uh, Robert Service said, or he's appalled and he can't stay detached from him. We also are not detached in some respects and we're not pretending to be uh, because we're not studying history from an academic point of view. We're trying to make our own history by doing that. And we're trying to learn and take the lessons and the inspiration from the Bolsheviks. And by making our own history, and the events we want to participate in um, and influence so that it can so that the the revolutionary party that we're trying to build can actually overthrow capitalism and those events will be so great i would say as to even put the you know the russian revolution to shade we don't want to be in a situation where in the future people are discussing what could have been um, at this moment in time in, 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 in history, I think 2020, I mean, 2019 was already a year of revolutions that we saw erupt all over the place. 
the task now for all Marxists is to build the organisations capable of actually leading the working class to victory and so that the masses don't move um, and in vain and don't, and don't waste that because it is only with a revolutionary party steeped in Marxist theory that we will actually see the working class take power and see the, the socialist transformation of society. Um, so hopefully you join us in the other revolution series, the other sessions, um, as we learn more from history, um, not from an academic point of view, but from a practical point of view, so that we can make our history now um, and, and, and set about, yeah, the building of a, of a genuine revolutionary organisation capable of changing the world. So. Just... Yeah, that was a really great close. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah, and I just want to say, like, um, obviously it can feel at the moment while we're all stuck in our houses and our bedrooms that we kind of can't do anything and that all of this stuff's just happening around us, but we really can do something right now and that something is um, is persuading people of these ideas and talking to people about these ideas. Um, so you need to... Uh, we, you all need to um, join the Marxist Student Federation and um, get involved with writing for our revolution newspaper. Um, and you all definitely need to come along to the meeting that we have next week. Um, next Thursday at six o'clock, it'll be exactly the same process as this. And that'll be on the Cuban revolution, uh, which is obviously again, a very inspiring, um, a very inspiring socialist revolution. Um, so yeah, just uh, make sure to, um, Make sure to research the MSF if you've never heard of us and join join us if you like our ideas and join Socialist Appeal. That's everything. I'm going to close the meeting now, but thank you all so much for coming. Bye. Bye.